Sometimes greatness is obvious. We see it coming a mile away, and when these exceptional individuals stand upon the mountaintop, we all nod and say, yes, of course they won. I couldn't imagine it any other way. But sometimes winners are waiting in the wings, holding out for their moment. It always seems obvious in retrospect, doesn't it? Once you look back on the career of a winner, it's always apparent that there was success on the horizon for them. A couple of lucky wins all of a sudden look like skilled victories. Losses will begin to look less like failure and more like a bad outing. The company they keep will start to look less and less like good fortune and more and more like good choices. I knew his name before Manchester. I knew he was good, but I didn't have the eyes to see him for the champion he was. Today, I'm putting my glasses on and taking a look back at the career of Eric Tong, better known as Fett. Well spot, excellent kill by him, but Fett's still holding it down, wasting time, where will they push it? Outlast have to decide, he lands one kill, the one that matters, finds the second, three for Fettuccini. The diffuser down and will do so successfully. As Beast Coast just keeps falling by the wayside, but hold on a second. Look at the size no. of the cojones on Fett. He gets the pick and then immediately hops on the diffuser. It's too easy! It's too fucking easy! This guy's are fucking shit! This guy's are fucking shit! But let me play at the fuse every single round! You are so shit! Who tried to set with the pro game? I told you! I told you! I'm the go! Who's the go? Who's the go? I'm the go! I've yet to meet someone whose first game was Siege, and that's no different here. So where did he get his start? My first game was Minecraft, I think. And then, and then I played League for too long. And then I played CSGO for way too long. And then I got R6. So pretty, pretty simple pipeline right there. Like many coaches, Fett would get his start as a player who, while American, would dip his toe in the comp scene to the north of our border in Canadian League quals. I did start my career as a player. I think a lot of people do. Um, I was an IGL. Uh, and my first ever team uh, had a lot of Canadians on it. Uh, just just happened to be so that way. So I, I eventually found myself like knowing a lot of Canadian players and associating myself with a lot of Canadian players uh, from the start. So, um, I think at the time the quals we're talking about were directly into Pro League um, because they were just forming like a new, you know, Canadian Pro League division and they just had straight up open quals like that go into Pro League. So I was like, well, that's, that's, that's great. Like, let's fucking, let's do that. Like, that's the next thing. So and I just happened to know a lot of Canadian people. So, um, yeah, that's, I think that's how that happened. There's plenty of players who would move to coaching when they just couldn't cut it in the server anymore, but he would have a better reason than most for moving to his new role. So I was entering college and I just realized that like, I can't, I wanted to control the quality of like what I deliver to my team uh, in terms of contribution. And I feel like if I was, you know, doing biomedical engineering and then also trying to play and like keep my sleep schedule good, trying to like play the game a lot, trying to be consistent as a player, it would be way too much um because that was pretty early in my playing career uh one of the struggles i had was with like my nerves and my shakes and like stuff like that and i kind of like skipped a lot of steps to get to playing um like I, I ended up like on teams with actually very very good players um so i kind of skipped i had a couple of leagues without getting pretty good myself and managing like my own mental so uh, i was just like i'm not able to control the the quality of products of my players if i'm you know, playing. Uh, so I just had to go coaching. It felt like more consistent to me. It felt like, you know, I could always prepare things ahead of time. I can always, you know, outside of the game, make sure like, you know, what I deliver to the team that I have is, is consistent and good. So yeah, that was the mindset with that. Fett thought he had moved on from playing, but after joining Team Panic, unexpected circumstances would land him back in the server. Gotcha picked me up as a coach and then... And then fucking our our guy Wings got like canceled or something. Like he got canceled on Twitter. I completely forgot what happened. I don't I don't want to think about it. Cause it's one day just like yeah, well I can't play anymore. I just got canceled. Like face it, banned me or something. And I was like, oh my god. I I was like first in line to step in and sub, and that's ended up being why I had to sub in. Yep. With a move to Aerial Arise, a career in esports was beginning to look like a possibility. It was it was like a tipping point I think for me was I realized, like, if I can put my all into something, it, 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 it produces results. 
as opposed to kind of half-assing it and like balancing it with school. I do remember that. It was definitely like a point where I was still kind of choosing um, between like, you know, my other activities in my life, other activities in my life and uh, Siege. But yeah, it was definitely a tipping point where I realized, okay, like I have potential if, should I put more effort in? A second place finish on his first season with Ariel would show his potential. However, a last place finish in the next season would have him looking for a new home, which he would find in the form of reality TV. So, yeah, so we got like dogged on on Ariel second season around. Um, and I think you see in my career, I, I'm a pretty flip flop type of guy. Like I'll go from doing really well to doing really poorly. I, I got second with Ariel, then eighth with Ariel, I believe. And then like undefeated with reality TV, then fucking group bet invite, then fourth in pro league, then last in pro league, then first in place. So, like I'm a very high fucking high rolling gambler some would say so uh shit the bet on ariel got dropped uh because i had uh emotional issues so i had to work on my personality a, a whole lot before getting onto reality tv which i'm proud of um and basically i just messaged mr b and i was like i was just trying to get on any cl team at that point as a head coach and i messaged mr b he did a tryout with me he liked what i had to say what i had to offer um, because within the first week of trialing with them, I was able to bring like a lot to the table, like in terms of concepts, theory, and culture. So it was good. Yeah, it was great. And we went undefeated. Getting the call up to T1 is always great news. However, getting that call from Mirage can be a bit tumultuous. That's time there was short-lived, but what he did as a result would act as an example of his commitment to excellence as he would pursue a spot in T1 competition, landing him with Elevate for invite that year. I just really, really wanted to, to get more experience. Um, yeah, so I was just reaching out to everyone and anyone. Um, at that point, I knew that my resume was impressive. I just know, because I'm going to be real, like, when I went into the coaching world, one of the biggest surprises to me was how many check sealers were. Uh, it was just, it was, like, shocking how easy it was to just simply improve my work to be at a level above many, 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 like, you know, other um, professional coaches. So, like, when I entered Mirage, um, at that point, I was already searching for a professional spot. And I got feedback from a lot of like other staffers that, hey, like your work is good. Like you're, you are T1 level. So I just really wanted to, you know, go there and get the experience, um, which I did. And I'm grateful for it. I learned a lot of lessons, uh, learned a lot of lessons with. Um, but yeah, I just messaged everyone. Elevate got a last, last second position. I literally joined like on the first day of groups. I prepped like five teams and like, and, like overnight in 24 hours. I like fucking rushed that shit really hard. Full grinded it out, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't get the result we wanted. Fed has talent in his field, and that's true enough. But what stands out is his work ethic, always striving for improvement in every aspect of his life, showing that hard work can truly be the road to success. All that work would continue to pay off as he would find his way to Beast Coast. Yeah, so I think Hyper was selected to pick out his own roster, uh, and then he... He like chose Mr. B and Gang, which is like a very smart move by Hyper, I think, and he wanted to stick with them. And obviously, Mr. B and Gang would choose me as their coach because, you know, I was with them since uh, Challenger League. Really. So yeah, I basically was picked up by the players, and I'm I'm grateful for that. Stage one would go well with veterans in Hyper and Vert helping to integrate the younger players on the team, but stage two of the same year would see the loss of those veteran players, a move that was more a mandate than a choice, and would lead to a subpar performance in the server. Yeah, it was definitely a, a large blunder on the overall, like, behalf of everyone. I think at the time, I don't want to go too deep into details, but the idea was, it wasn't necessarily a decision motivated by anything other than budget is the most I'll say. I think the two biggest factors going into that disaster of stage two was, was budget and lack of available free agents. And yet, yeah, obviously, now I've go back and I realized it was a mistake. Like I realized I should have tried to, to keep a vet and also uh, push for, for more budget. Um, because as you can see, it led to like a breakdown of leadership, breakdown of culture, and obviously a breakdown of uh, performance from the team. That version of Beast Coast would say their goodbyes to each other, but Fett was left with the keys to the kingdom and an opportunity to put together a roster capable of winning. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing I learned from stage two is um, experience, how important experience is, right? Like I lost Hyper and Vert and we just shit the bed. So I was like, okay, like experience is obviously important, but also experience within players that kind of wanted to push the limits of the game. Um, so my first piece started with, with Gunner uh, and Gav. 
Uh, so I was at the Atlanta Major, and Gunner comes up to me. He was like, yeah, fat. I got dropped. Um, and I was like, I knew I wanted this guy. So <laughs> again, I was like, this guy um, existed on a culture of a team where he was kind of scapegoated so hard. Yet in all the videos I saw of them, he was the one still trying to be like the mental leader, giving the speeches, giving the game plans. So I was like, I need this guy, right? Like a guy getting, you know, dogged on so hard by, you know, the community and the pressure. And he's still trying to do that with this team. Like that guy, you know, iron mental. I somehow knew Gav would get dropped from DZ, like before it even happened. Like they were playing and I was like, I got a feeling they're going to drop Gav. So I was like, tell him Foza how I wanted Gav. Um, and eventually, I mean, I would go through like iterations of the roster as more people became available. Um, I wanted... You know Tristan at the time because uh, he it seemed like he would play and that was an idiotic move by me. Um, I wanted Kansan at the time and we had like kind of like a tentative trial roster. Um, and eventually the pieces kept moving into place where Spirits like got his motivation back, I guess, to play because it, it seemed for a while like he wanted to retire and then he got his motivation back and we tried him out and he was really really good, um, hot and cold, really really good. Uh, in, in trials once again like that guy became available i think ssg released him like randomly yeah and, and he became available and everyone was like oh shit we gotta get this guy like gunner was hell bent on getting hot and cold and then tristan obviously fucked us over like the day before the day of roster lock and uh well we got diffuser thank god on paper the roster was strong but was it the instant success that it felt like while watching yes and no um we had a system with tristan that seemed to work very well um, the biggest issue is that when Tristan left, we tried to slot someone directly into his shoes, and that simply was not a role that Diffuser was comfortable on. Um, we also were trying to push for theory that was outdated and strats that, you know, weren't our style and, you know, a culture that didn't fit everyone. Um, so the, the thing is, like, everyone keeps talking about the perfect combination of factors and players and blah, 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 but it's like it really was – a lot of headbanging and hard work. Like when we went down 03, we had like a three hour debrief afterwards where I just asked everyone, like, what do you think of this role change? What do you think of doing this instead? What do you think of changing this to our culture? What do you think of doing this instead? Uh, and we en ended up going through with almost all those changes. We did a role change, theory change, changed all our strats, changed our map pool, changed our perma bands, changed our culture, changed how we perceive things, you know, like everything. Everything was changed and it clicked. Thank God it clicked. Um, and we just kept improving from there. And I think like the biggest thing about these players that is so amazing is that it is the word ever changing, right? Like everyone's always okay with like whatever best version of us is always changing. There's no like definition of perfect. It's like whatever works in the moment, like something that didn't work for us before might start working now. And that's okay. As long as we keep trying, we keep learning and we keep pursuing the next big thing. And that's what I'm proud of. So of this team is we worked so incredibly goddamn hard and some of it might have been luck and some of it might have been hard work but at the end of the day we banged our heads till it worked so with their new roster beast coast found themselves at the top of north america and heading to the manchester major it was a new experience for fett and he would have to learn on his feet i know it's common for players to have an adjustment period to that land environment but is it just as hard to adjust as a coach I, I, I definitely think mental leadership is, you know, it's whatever. Um, it became pretty easy and natural to me, like just being a mental leader, just like, yo, like, this is the plan for today. Do this, like, let's calm, let's blah, 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 I'm not getting stressed out. But definitely, like, you know, going from watching maybe like a clean feed on gate, like on game day, like from one person to all having all five monitors worth of info to you, but like not necessarily on your screen as a five split screen, but like, like that. I, it sounds stupid, but like I had, I had to get used to that, and it was hard. Like I'm not kidding. Like everyone's heads blocking their own monitor, and like trying to like flick between screens to get info to call like a good timeout. That was hard. Everyone's gonna like clown me for that shit, but I swear to God, that was so fucking hard to me. So yeah, I definitely really, really had to adjust to that. Um, the first couple games of the event, I was calling like horrible, horrible fucking timeouts, horrible counter timeouts. Um, I was like low key like getting. It, it, it will sound stupid, but I swear to God, like nerves as a coach, you know, because um, I am an experience in terms of being on land, right? And, you know, there's games you go into and, you, you know, like you don't really have the same flow of thought and focus. So first couple of games of calling like absolute dog shit timeouts. And I realized that. So I slapped myself in the face and I, you know, started studying the enemy teams harder, um, you know, and because of that, I uh, 
I came in the game is way better prepared, way way more focused. And I would call, I think for for PSG Talon, for Phase, and for Liquid, um, and for ITB, I called clinical fucking timeouts. I also I shit the bet against BDS definitely, but for those four those four teams, I, I definitely did a really really good job in my opinion. The first place finish back at home would mean the team would be going directly into stage two which means that you can play essentially any of the 15 other teams at the event over the next couple of days, which is a nightmare for a strategic coach attempting to get his team ready. So how did he do it? Understanding the, the international landscape of strategy and maps is one of the biggest things. Um, pretty early on, you could tell that like, despite the fact that we won against DZ on consulate, um, within practice against international teams, the NA is just is fucking horseshit as consulate. Like it's, it's pathetic. Like, not a single NA team understands wind comes on that map. Um, you know, Skyscraper is another map that Brazil and Apex simply just have that much ground on. And then obviously we found out that, you know, NA is really good at Cafe and Nighthaven, thanks to Dark Zero. I mean, they the only team that actually pushes meta on those maps. Um, so, you know, we just dog in teams on Nighthaven, realizing it's like, you know, a map we're willing to take any team on, except for like fellow NA teams. Uh, Cafe as well. Um, and yeah, just kind of figuring that out. And, you know, lo and behold, during that bootcamp, we developed our sky. Uh, if, you know, anyone does just simple stats, you'll see that we permanent sky of all of our stage. And then we fucking whipped it out versus a bunch of teams and we won it every single time. So, you know, just kind of during that bootcamp period, when you have the inner chance to scrim international teams, realizing, okay, like what maps is North America good at? What maps are other regions good at? And then what can we work on? And what do we just have to say? chalk it you know chalk, chalk this map even though we don't want any teams on it in north america chalk this map because just we're just so behind regardless it's clear he had learned from the mistakes of the last stage filling a team with veterans who had been there and done that and as a result it all came together quite well oh yeah 100 percent. and i definitely think like everyone was on the exact same page about like everything in terms of going to international events i didn't even have to like set a culture much for that boot camp um everyone was just already on the same page like don't overreact, you know, be objective about these like scrum scores and whatnot and just understand like what works for us, what we need to learn and develop. And everyone was very helpful to Diffuser, I think, in terms of like helping him progress uh, as, a, as a rookie. Swiss stage wasn't a cakewalk for Beast Coast, but they finished the stage three and two with convincing wins and close losses as they stepped out to play on the main stage. You would expect the stress level to increase, but that isn't what happened. The first two games, absolutely not. I, I was just. It was so, or at least personally for me, I was so dialed. And honestly, like, Diffuser plays better in front of a crowd for some fucking reason. Like, he he, he actually had a pretty poor Swiss stage performance, and he was, like, kind of in his own head. And then he suddenly steps onto a main stage in front of a crowd, and it gets easier for him. Like, he starts railing people, starts one-tapping people. Like, I don't know. That guy's a monster. Um, but, um, yeah, for me, first two games, absolutely not. I think we played pretty clinical games against Brazil. I think I studied the shit out of that region to prepare for both those games, um, and I think it paid off. Um, we just knew everything they needed to win, and we were able to counter it and play our own game and, you know, purely, like, out aura them at times, honestly. Um, but that oh, was great. It was fun. I absolutely love the English crowd. Uh, I personally could hear all of it. I don't know about my players because they had earbuds in, but I could hear, like, almost everything, mostly everything. They had gone blow for blow with FaZe in the Swiss stage, and heading into the rematch, I'll admit, while I was rooting for NA, I viewed the Brazilian team as a tough mountain to climb. They were a round away from being the best team in the world just a few months ago, so they were certainly playing with a chip on their shoulder and well-earned high expectations. But while BC expected a barn burner, that's certainly not what happened as they would go on to walk through phase with a generational performance from Gunner. As the players get ready to play the next day, the coach's job never stops, working to prepare their team for the next opponent. But how does the night go? How do you get better? It's just a lot, a lot, a lot of odd review. Like, like a, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of auto view um, for me personally. Um, because I think going back to that phase decision to take us to cafe, like I think a lot of teams are, are data driven. So they'll see we lost a DZ on cafe and they'll be like, okay, like that, you know, like that's a map we could take him to. I, I try to be a bit more objective than that. Um, obviously data is nice and you, you should take it into account, but, there's a reason during the NAL stage, I saw DZ 7-2 LG on Chalet, and we still took them to that map, you know? Like, there's a reason that happened, right? So, um, 
that's what all the VOD reviewing essentially comes up to is I don't want to leak too much, but I, I feel like by watching how they strategically play the map, I see better how we play into their maps. Obviously, the late nights worked out as the team would go on to dash the hopes of Brazil, knocking out fan favorites in Team Liquid to secure themselves a spot in the Grand Finals, as history would go on to repeat itself, with the best of NA facing off against the best of Europe in a story as old as Siege itself. BDS was a fan favorite coming into the event for sure, but by now, it was clear that Beast Coast came to play. With momentum on their side, you had to wonder if they still felt like underdogs in that moment, or if they walked in feeling like the favorites. I wanted the team to go into it with underdog mentality, but I definitely felt like we had the harder road there and the more amount of lessons learned and the more developed map pool as a team. So um, map one, we played well. Map two, I expected to lose because it was consulate. Map three, we completely threw and they out us on. Um, but then after that, we started playing our game again, so it didn't matter. The team had momentum on their side, but BDS weren't going to go away quietly, taking it to all five maps with one specific standout performance that kept them in the game. Likey Fox is so good. Like <laughs> that guy's just that guy's just way too good at the game. No single player performance was going to slow them down though, and it's clear that nothing this team does is random. Plenty of good teams found themselves unable to find footing against BC, who seem to catch everyone on their worst day. But while they make it look easy, it's anything but luck. The biggest thing is you, you got to realize like one 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 of one of the parts of our philosophy. I don't want to leak too much, but people will always say about the teams we go against. Wow, they played horrible today. Phase looked like an APAC team today. And you wonder, like, after a certain amount of time, if every single team we play against looks horrible, you wonder if that's part of our game plan. Um, so we have a specific game plan for each team. And, you know, it, it shuts down. It completely shuts them down. I don't want to say how we do it, but, you know, that, that, that is part of our game plan. We make teams look like amateurs. It's part of our game planning. Like, we know exactly how to do that. The worst part is for BDS is... They're, they have five monsters on that team. So it's like you can try to shut down as many of that team as possible. One of them is going to come through. And unfortunately, that happened to be fucking six feet, seven fucking monsters, muscle monster, like you fact, just tearing through our fucking asses. Like first on a border, I don't, you can put this up on your screen like or note it down to put it here. That push where we fake the plant archives and rush armory side, we you can see that we pull three people to fountain side, like on the vault. Like they, they, there's three people coming fountain. And the one person on Armory side where the actual push is coming from is Likey Fact, and he just runs circles on us, dude. I was like, it's, what, what is going on? That guy's just actually railing us. I couldn't believe it. While they stumbled in moments for sure, over five rounds, the team would go on to prove that as of today, Beast Coast is the best team in the world. Players often get all the credit, and they deserve a lot of it. But what a coach can bring to a team should never be underestimated. Given the faith of his org, Fett would go on to build a team that honestly shouldn't have been possible. You simply can't find more experience than a player like Hot and Cold. From the first day he stepped into the league, Gunner made it clear he was talented enough to slug it out with the best. If you look up Grinder in the dictionary, you'll find a picture of Spirits. That guy simply doesn't know how to stop working. BZ has a way of making world-class talents look like a simple cog in the machine, but they also have an eye for greatness, which is why Gavini got the call from them in the first place, and why it was a shock to so many when he was let go. Then we look to Diffuser, someone who was clearly talented coming off an Element 2 win, but he found new levels when surrounded by teammates such as these. In all honesty, that's just one of those things that shouldn't have worked. The forming of this team is something that should not have been possible, but it became so much more than the sum of its parts. To burst onto the stage, beating your region, and then the world in only a few short months is a fairy tale story if there ever was one. But now the hard work begins. Few stay on top in Siege for more than a moment, so I encourage this team to soak it in today because they earn that. But they're going to have to get back on the horse tomorrow because they will wake up as targets for everyone in the world the moment they step back upon the stage. You'll see them in the World Cup quals, which are right around the corner. How will they do? I don't know. They'll be back fending off the best of NA come stage two. Will they come out on top yet again? I don't know. Winning the major qualifies them for SI. Will they be the next American team to lift the hammer? I don't know. Well, you don't know anything. What do you know? Rude. Anyway, the only thing I know for sure is that while Fett has set his team up for success, they will have to carry on without him. Pursuing a PhD in biomedical engineering is what's next on the horizon for Fett, and as a result, he's announced his departure from the team following the World Cup. This leads me to an interesting conclusion, however. As since the World Cup isn't an official event run by Blast, that will mean that this crazy son of a bitch will go on to accomplish what even the greatest in our scene couldn't. 
he will have won the last game he was a part of, walking away at the top of the world knowing that he and his team were truly the best in his final moments. Across all of time and all of sports, this feat is rare even among the most elite of champions. As I sit writing this, only one comes to mind. I hope we as a community can come together and wish him the best as he carries on to a bright future. No one truly knows how tomorrow will play out. We have our hopes, our dreams, and maybe even expectations, but we can't know until it happens. All I can be sure of today is that I found another team to root for. Until they're back in action, I'll be linking Fett's socials down below, and I'll let him say his own goodbyes to his fans. I mean, thank you so much for, for vibing with us. Thank you so much for feeling our energy. It, it means the world to me. Um, my favorite part of the whole event is seeing the fans after, finally. Um, and yeah, you guys just remind me and our whole team why we do it. Right? Like, it, If y'all didn't exist, like people would be burnt out. People wouldn't want to play this game anymore. But because you know the players get to feel that reward of the fans cheering for them, I, I, I'm sure it powers them up and makes them want to you know, go even harder each and every single time they play. Fett brought together a roster and helped lead them to a victory on the world stage. They set a new standard for excellence, and it will be up to the rest of the world to catch up. For now, though, that'll do it for me. If you're still hanging around, do me a favor and drop a sub if you enjoyed the content. I should have Mass Effect 2 up next, and I'll bring you Siege content wherever someone makes the time to talk to me. For now, though, this is Purple signing off. Have a wonderful night, and always remember to smile. Thanks, guys.